from the USDA Rural Development Office. Uh, Carlotta, if you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Carlotta Denisi with USDA Rural Development. I've been with the agency for um, many, many years, and I am located in Olympia in our um, state office. And I'll be talking about two of our programs that assist uh, ag producers. Great. Um, and I'll turn it over to uh, Ryan McCarthy, who's also with North Olympic Development Council. Hi, I'm Ryan McCarthy, and I'm a new member of the team at North Olympic Development Council, and I serve as a farm food business advisor. And I have experience with both the Value Added Producer Grant and REAP grants, and have uh, been re a recipient of three awards between the two programs, and I'm excited to use my experience to support farm food businesses navigating the grant process however I can. Great. Um, and then we've got Pat Milliman here on behalf of the Jefferson County Farmers Market. Hi everyone, Pat from the market, uh, primarily serving as your training coordinator for this. Um, so I'll be mostly in the background here today and I am in Port Townsend. Great, and then I will turn it over to uh, Kelly Henwood who many of you probably know from WSU Regional Small Farms um, and she'll also go over some Zoom etiquette. Thanks Elise, hi everyone. I'm Kelly Henwood with WSU Extension and the Regional Small Farms Program and a partner in this training series. And I'm based in Jefferson County, but I serve Clallam, Jefferson and Kitsap County. Yeah, that's great. And actually, uh, Kelly, before we go into Zoom etiquette, so I did wanna mention uh, for those of you who are just coming in, so this is a collaborative series um, between NODC, uh, WSU Regional Small Farms and also uh, Jefferson County Farmers Market. And um, today's workshop is made possible uh, by funding from both USDA Rural Business Development Grant, as well as a Washington State Microenterprise Association Grant from the Washington State Department of Commerce. So thanks to them. Great, thanks Elise. So just a few Zoom, Zoom etiquette tips for you all who are joining us today. Uh, we will be presenting some information. If you have questions about any of the information that's presented today, please utilize the Q&A function um, that should be on your toolbar. If you're joining on a computer, it's at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining on a phone, I believe you have to swipe over a few times to access that. But um, if you have an immediate question, you're welcome to use the chat, but we're hoping that folks direct their questions to the Q&A function and our speakers and facilitators can answer your question. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to you all after it's over. Um, we will email it to you all, but it will also live on our WSU online learning library. And you'll receive the link to that as well, including a resource list. There will be lots of resources referenced today. So there will be a PDF list that has been compiled with all of these links and resources. So please just tune in and listen and come with your questions. And at the end of the webinar, we will have an opportunity for you all to fill out an evaluation. Since there are two grants that are attached to this training series, we would love to hear your uh, outcomes and learning experiences from this webinar. So uh, keep an eye out for that in the chat. Okay, I think that's it, Elise. I'm, I just wanna double check that for visuals, is are you sharing your screen right, right now, Elise? It should be, is it not? And I'm, not, I, I'm yeah. not seeing it, but are other people seeing a, a presentation mode? This guy goes, sorry about that. Last minute switch. Just wanna make sure that everyone can see what you're sharing and not just your video. Yeah. So this, are we there now? I'm not seeing it here. Don't see any shared screen. Okay. Sorry about that. One second. Oh. 
Hi, my really sorry about this, everyone. It's giving me all sorts of errors. I'm going to try sharing a different way. Okay. No problem. What did I get for switching things at the last second. <laughs> Well, while Lisa is, is finding that, I'm just going to bring everyone's attention to the other events in the series that we have. Um, I'm posting the link in the chat. You can sign up and pre-register. We have a combination of another webinar online. We have in-person opportunities um, all around assisting your small business in financial planning, bookkeeping, sales, tax preparation, a number of marketing sessions, um, responding to microaggressions. There's a fantastic series that we've designed for you all. So if you haven't signed up for those yet, please do so. We have lots of space. And if you have any questions about them, we'd be happy to answer them today in the Q&A or chat. All right. Yeah, sorry, I'm still waiting <laughs> for this to uh, download or start sharing. Um, one sec. Apologies, everyone. No worries. Technology is grand, except for when it doesn't do what you want it yeah. to do. <laughs> and this is what I was afraid. I was afraid that things would start getting kind of laggy and I would run into issues. So. Are you moving over to the Google Drive one version? Yeah. Okay. There we I go. Think progress. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All that. Okay. Sorry, everyone. It's still not full screen, I don't think, but we're going to roll with it. I'm not going to mess with anything anymore. <laughs> okay. So thank you, everyone, for bearing with me. Um, so today, what we're planning to do is basically go through the different funding opportunities that are available for farm and food businesses. Um, discuss the resource providers in the region, so the people that are here to help you should you decide to apply for any of those grants. Um, I'll briefly discuss some general tips for grant application, be that uh, federal, state, or a smaller private um, grant. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Carlotta, and she will specifically be discussing the USDA grants, um, the Rural Energy for America program, as well as uh, the Value Added Producer Grant. And then we will turn it to NODC's Ryan McCarthy, because as he mentioned, he's been a recipient of both of these grants in the past. So he's got experience um, that is super valuable to share with you all on both applying and implementing those grants. Um, so like I said, we'll be discussing uh, the REAP and VAPG grants today. Some of you may already be familiar with those. Those are kind of um, the two big ones available for producers that uh, occur um, on an annual basis. So they're, they're regularly available. Um, many of you may have joined us late last fall. We did a webinar around this WDA Local Food System Infrastructure Grant. Um, and I hope many of you applied for that. And uh, I think we all had heard rumblings that these might, um, there might be another round in the spring. And so just recently uh, they posted, it's not the same grant, but there is another infrastructure grant um, available now, the Resilient Food System Infrastructure Grant. Um, so there are some differences. It's not the same grant, but um, just so you know, those, those WSDA opportunities, especially the local food system infrastructure, that was its second year. So um, hopefully those will become recurring and you will all become familiar with those as well. Um, in terms of other opportunities, so it's not just, um, you're not just constricted to federal or state opportunities. There are also smaller private funders that have funds available and kind of depending on the niche of your operation and what you do, um, there might be other, other sources of funding out there to support you. 
So this is this uh, slide is by no means exhaustive, but um, just wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of what's out there. So if you have, if you're practicing organic and sustainable practices, um, I did want to highlight that the Tilth Alliance has one open right now that is due February 19th. So if that's something interesting to you, um, definitely check that out. And uh, if you haven't started yet, given that it's due on the 19th, I would start like pretty much as soon as this webinar is over. Um, and I also want to say that if you have questions, if you need more details about any of these that are listed here or any others that might apply to you, please reach out and we can connect you with information and resources. Um, if you're a new and emerging um, farmer food business, there's, a, for example, AgWest has a new producer grant. Um, if you're interested in being part of research, there are um, both this Western SARE and uh, WA. WSDA compost reimbursement programs. Um, so a lot of times these are focused on things like soil health. So in exchange for grant funds, you are um, volunteering to be part of ongoing research about soil health or whatever their focus might be. Um, NRCS, so in addition to kind of their offsets that they help provide for things like hoop houses and whatnot, they also do have, for example, this conservation innovation grant um, that's available. If you're an animal uh, farmer, uh, there are supports out there for you as well. Um, for example, there's this FACT Food Animal Concerns Trust um, Fund a Farmer Grant, um, and that one primarily is focused on increasing animal welfare in your operation. Um, and if you're a veteran, there are also grants out there specific for veteran farmers. Um, and I wanted to end with this one because even if you don't go for one that is specifically for veterans, um, if you are a veteran or a woman in, and minority owned business, uh, a lot of times you can score extra points in scoring criteria for a lot of the grants um, for having that minority um, designation. So just things to keep in mind. Um, in terms of resource providers in the area, so North Olympic Development Council, um, we offer a number of services, but one of the things we can help with specific to grants. So if you are thinking about um, putting together a project idea for a specific grant and want to make sure that it's a good fit for whatever that uh, grant is, we can definitely help you, you know, bounce some ideas, get a strong proposal together, um, a strong project idea. Uh, we can also help with things like budget pr preparation and review, uh, as well as narr like your actual bulk narrative. So the bulk of your writing, we can help with review and editing of that. Uh, similarly, our friends over at the Center for Inclusive Entrepreneurship, or CIE, they offer many of the same supports. Um, again, if you and anyone listed on this slide, we all work collabor collaboratively together. So if you come to one of us and are looking for something, we can put you in touch with the right people. So don't hesitate to reach out if you're looking for support and we will make sure you get it. Um, also wanna make sure that if you are not signed up for the WSU Ag Newsletter, definitely sign up for that. It's a great resource, tons of um, workshops, classes, everything, and a very timely update on any grants that may be approaching. So rather than continually scouring and seeing what grants are available right now for ag um, producers. If you check that, um, if you're opening and reading that uh, email, uh, Kelly does a great job of including those. Um, and then Amanda Milholland, who is the director of Jefferson County Farmers Market, she's not here today, but she did want me to highlight that um, the Farmers Market offers its own small grant to uh, new new vendor businesses. So in the first one to three years um, with a focus on BIPOC businesses. And then Craft3 is a lending service, but a lot of the uh, supports that they can provide. So um, things you'd have to do to prepare um, for a loan as a business owner, a lot of that can be transferred over to uh, grant applications as well. And similarly, EDC Team Jefferson, um, they offer a lot of business development services. And again, a lot of that can be um, maybe not exactly tailored to a grant, but um, is very transferable. 
Um, in terms of general tips for um, having a successful application, um, biggest thing, and you will hear this highlighted in probably Carlotta and Ryan's uh, presentations, is just not waiting. Um, depending on the grant, it can really take a lot more of your time than you anticipate. Um, so just not waiting till the last minute. As soon as you find out about it is a good time to start. Um, and so especially with things like letters of support and commitment, those are not the same. Um, I think Ryan might talk about that, uh, the differentiation a little bit later, but um, if they ask for, even if it's just suggested and not required, definitely is good to have those letters of support and or commitment. Um, and so reach out to your people who you're gonna be asking for um, early and, and you're probably gonna have to nag them about it. They may ask you to ghost write a letter for them. Um, so, and you know, you can do that with a simple Google, Google search. If you wanna try playing around with AI, that's a good way to get that template going, or you can reach out to the resource providers and we can help you craft um, that template. So you can give that to whoever you're requesting these from. Um, also UEI, some of you may be familiar familiar with this. Some of you may have just heard of it, but it's your unique entity identifier. And so you have to have this number if you are going to receive funds from the federal government. Um, it's kind of an onerous process, but um, you just do it once, you get your number, and then you're done. You don't have to do this every single time you apply for a federal grant. Um, so and then it's not always an immediate turnaround on that number. So again, giving yourself, if you think you're ever gonna apply for a USDA grant or anything like that, just go ahead and apply and get this step out of the way. Um, things like having a budget template on hand, again, that's something a resource provider can help you with. Um, and you're probably gonna have to adjust that for each project, but just having something to start with so you're not starting from scratch each time um, can be a time saver. Um, considering things like matching funds, which again, I'll let Ryan and or Carlotta discuss more. Um, and then also just good practice to, if it's a resource provider or if it's a trusted friend or family that you want to review your proposal, which is always good practice, um, getting a draft to them, you know, a good week before the deadline so that they have time to really look at it, make meaningful edits and contributions, and then you have time to to really incorporate those and submit your best work. Because if, if you're taking it down to the wire, it's not gonna be your best work and you want all your effort to go um, towards your strongest proposal. Um, and then also just submitting early, especially things like grants.gov, which are kind of clunkier systems or can be. And we all live on the peninsula or many of us do. And so we're no strangers to things like power outages or spotty internet, <laughs> as you saw. Um, so uh, you don't wanna leave this to fate or technology. Um, if it's due at five and you submit at 501, it's it's not gonna go any further than that. So um, just for your own sanity and all that hard work you've put in, uh, try to submit it a little bit early so that so you're not up against that deadline. Um, and then also office hours. So I know that WSDA offered office hours as, for their um, infrastructure grant. Um, so that's a time. It's really great. Y'all are very busy and it's hard to carve out this time anyway. So if they offer, you know, like every Thursday for two hours, that's a great time to write into your schedule if you can to be working on your application and there's someone uh, in the room um, via Zoom that you can unmute and ask a question and you can get your question answered in real time. So it's just a really great resource. So if it's offered, definitely recommend taking advantage of that. Um, I wanted to just show you all, if you haven't um, registered for your UEI before, I wanted you to see what it actually looks like when you go to sam.gov, um, just because there are scams out there that are gonna try to get your money to get this UEI number. So this is what the page actually looks like. If you go to sam.gov, you'll click on this, get started, um, and then it will provide you with uh, a checklist that you can actually print out. And it will require a lot of different numbers, different documents. So print out that checklist, um, gather all those documents, and then set aside a big chunk of time where you won't get distracted and pulled away, where you can just sit down, go through that checklist and get it done. Um, it's not necessarily always the best system at alerting you if you've made a mistake or something like that. So 
trying to minimize distraction and just getting it done in one go, um, highly suggest. So again, it's free. If you wind up on a site that's asking you for money or you're hearing from people reaching out saying they can do this for you for money, it's a scam, don't do it. <laughs> just uh, go the free route and trust your checklist. Um, in terms of implementation, so uh, thing to keep in mind, grants are great. Um, they're super helpful, but they're not free money. They come with, you have to provide something in return for that money. Um, so there are implications in terms of, you know, when tax season comes, and as Kelly mentioned, one of the workshops we're offering is uh, helping farmer and food businesses prepare for tax season. So um, things, uh, you'll need like a 1099 um, for your tax returns if you've re received grant funds. Um, and then also you will have to be reporting on your budget spend down and your progress towards your deliverables that you outlined in your project. So um, it's not like someone just cuts you a check and is like, great job, see you later. Um, you're gonna have to uh, report back on what you did and they want you to succeed. Um, so if if you're awarded a grant, yay, and they say, here's your, your contract specialist or your program officer or whatever, your point of contact, Definitely utilize them if you're if you're running into issues. Like they understand that, you know, we're all living in real life and things happen, and they want to help you navigate any issues that are coming up. So reach out to them; they're a great resource. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to a great resource, uh, Carlotta Denisi. Thank you. All right, good job, Elise. Um, you got some of that. Uh, um, some of that grant info kind of out of the way. So I'll kind of repeat it as I go. Um, I wanted to repeat again that I'm located in Olympia and I generally cover our programs up on the peninsula as well as in the Southwest area. And really uh, myself and um, four other specialists across the state are also available, but we're very responsive to um, calling and emailing and getting those questions answered. If you're, you know, at the end of this, if you're going to proceed with one of these grants, I think it's a really good idea to just go ahead and reach out to me. We can kind of talk through it because it can seem uh, really confusing when you're like, oh, here's an application template and all these forms. But it, sometimes it comes together a little bit easier when you have somebody that really is trying to help you be successful. And we, you know, in our state, we're really competitive as a, as a state goes, as far as getting as many um, eligible projects in our state. And so, you know, all of us in our state, we just really work from that point of view is let's help our applicants the best we can, because we don't want just a bunch of applications, but we want eligible, complete applications. And then in most cases, scoring well applications. So we are a good ally for you um, when you get started to make sure that you're going to be able to get through it, but also score well as well as be eligible. So with that, I will uh, proceed in, Elise will, on the slides. Okay, so the first program I'm going to talk about is Renewable Energy for America program, which we just simply call REAP. So this program we've been we've had available to rural small businesses and farmers. Um, I think it's been, we've had it for about 15 years. It's funded under the Farm Bill. Um, recently under the um, Inflation Reduction Act, a, a much larger amount of funds has been made av available so that we're funding almost all the applications that are made and also under that Inflation Reduction Act, I believe it's supposed to, the extra money is supposed to continue nine years, which also gives us um, some uh, funding that pays uh, grant writers and that kind of thing for the assistance for a REAP application. So I'll mention that again later, but, um, and it's free, free to applicants. So under our REAP program, um, you the, it, the projects are for renewable energy systems or energy efficiency improvements. And what is really awesome is that our grant can cover 50% of your eligible project either way, whether it's renewable energy or energy efficiency. On this slide, it does mention guaranteed loan financing. 
typically we, um, we're not utilizing that. That would be where banks are making a loan and we would guarantee it. For most of the, um, the grants and combinations that we use, generally folks have their 50% matching funds either um, via a loan through a bank or credit union or um, some other. But if it's a really large project, a lender may want to look at our guaranteed loan program. But we'll go to the next slide now. So um, there are some minimum and maximums for the grant. Um, again, uh, the grant can cover 50% of the total project costs. Under renewable energy systems like solar and um, things like that, the minimum project cost is 10,000 and the maximum grant request would be a million. So there's quite a lot of flexibility. Under the energy efficiency, uh, minimum um, project cost 6,000 and maximum grant would be 500,000. Next. Next slide, yeah. Um, okay, I wasn't sure what the next slide was. Uh, I wanted to mention under renewable energy, it's not just for solar. Uh, it could be, although we don't, wind is not really that applicable over here on the west side, but um, it's sometimes done, but there are other renewable energy um, projects that are done. And then under energy efficiency projects, those are ones where you have an energy audit and it's been outlined what you can do to reduce energy on your farm or business. So um, new lighting, HVAC, it could be insulation, could be um, uh, equipment, um, updated energy efficiency equipment, those kind of things fall under energy efficiency. Okay, so um, applicants, um, ag producers, uh, and those are um, ag producers that are, that over 50% of their gross income are from ag operations. Now we have a lot of farmers that receive our grant and they're qualifying as a small business, maybe even a sole proprietor, but they can be an LLC. So if you're an ag producer, but you don't think that uh, your income is over 50% from um, ag revenue, you can still qualify as a, as a small business entity, even if you, you know, you're operating as a farm, that's perfectly fine. Uh, okay, move on. Next slide. Um, as a small business, okay, go back to the other slide. <laughs> as to qualify as a small business under um, Small Business Administration size standards, which is what we use to qualify. It can be a private for-profit entity, which is what we usually see. It could be a cooperative, like a food co-op, um, electric utility, um, or tribal businesses that are separate from the tribe. Um, for rural, um, it would need to be in communities under 50,000. So in Clallam and Jefferson is 100% uh, rural. In Kitsap, there may be some areas that are not considered rural. But then if it was an ag producer that qualified as an ag producer, then the rural wouldn't count. Anyway, all another reason to be confused and give me a call. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, I mentioned briefly that we do have partners that um, through other grants that we provide are able to um, assist with grant writing under our REAP program. And um, Spark Northwest, in conjunction with Pierce Conservation District and a couple other entities, are able to um, assess your needs on your farm or your business to see, um, a, 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 yeah, do an energy assessment for renewable energy and or an energy audit um, and for free. And then in addition, which is very important, is actually um, fill out the forms for you after gathering all of that necessary uh, information that they would work closely with. And this has worked really well for quite a number of years. They've got the, the process um, down pretty, pretty well, down to a science. So I recommend that also. Thank you. Um, okay, here's the slide I thought I was gonna look at earlier. 
So obviously under renewable energy systems, these are all um, um, systems that we would look at for our REAP program. And generally, we're seeing almost all solar. Um, we've done a couple very small hydroelectric projects. Um, and, and years ago, we did some anaerobic digesters up, up north by the border and things like that. Next slide. And under energy efficiency improvement, and I mentioned some of these, um, all of these would be things that could be included in an energy efficiency improvement. And I could mention at this time that an applicant could actually apply for both. They would be two separate applications, but you could actually be applying for energy efficiency improvements and at the same time, a, um, a renewable energy system in the same year, as long as they're two separate applications. Next slide. Um, I have a couple of examples here, but I, I would go ahead and um, go back to um, mentioning when REAP applications are due. We're actually just processing them on a quarterly basis. So at the end of each month is a deadline for that quarter where we're processing um, that number of applications that we get in. So, uh, and then the process is, is that we review them for eligibility. Uh, we score them um, on a number of uh, metric items and, and then we line them up for funding. So far, uh, so good. We have been funding all the applications that have been coming in. Um, this is just an example um, of a solar project. Badgley Barn and Ranch. And through their solar project, they're saving almost 30,000 kilowatts per year. Now, in the green part, this that grant was actually when we were still only at a 25% um, payment on the grant refund. So now we're at 50%. So okay, we can move on. Um, actually, in Port Townsend, we, we did an energy efficiency improvement um, to the Port Townsend Inn, and they replaced all of their existing, I think they were baseboard heaters, <laughs> in all the rooms with ductless heat pumps. Uh, so this was a pretty good um, energy efficiency improvement and as saving them 42,000 kilowatts a year on their business use. And again, up in there in that green if they had um, if they had not done it when they did it and approved now they would have fifty percent, but who would have guessed that that, that was going to come through go through All right, so they I did go through the reap pretty quickly, but um, it's much simpler um, application process than you would think. Of course, with the application, we gather things like your income tax return, your um, you know uh, evidence of ownership. If you're in a lease type situation, um, a lease agreement, um, we gather federal forms with that. Um, but it's all doable. And again, I would remind people that if you were uh, not already doing business or signed up through system for award management for your UEI number, you would definitely want to get started on that so that you would be able to apply on that quarter, you know, whatever the end of the um, each quarter is. Okay, moving on to our value added producer grant. Okay, this is a um, program specifically for ag producers and ranchers. Um, this one is announced on an annual basis. It just came out on um, February 17th, which gave a 90-day window. So now we're, we're kind of um, losing time on that uh, for to apply um, through grants.gov, which we don't uh, recommend. We recommend that you apply by paper or also you know, by sending an email is April 16th. So I've put April 11th on here just as a, as a good marker, but we do prefer to receive your full application by email or a paper format. 
Um, that way we are not concerned with whether anything got hung up in grants.gov and that kind of thing. And in the past that has happened. So that's my best um, recommendation for that. Um, the main thrust of the value-added producer grant is to help ag producers realize more revenue for your income. So it's not a program for pre-harvest. Um, it's all post-harvest expenses from processing, and we'll go over it. But what it is, is definitely not is for infrastructure, for, for farm equipment, for buildings, that kind of thing. But let's go through the slides. Um, there's two types um, of uses for the value added producer grant. Um, under planning grants, um, this is used for if you're really not ready to roll out your project and do the value added, but you want to do some planning. Let's say you want to do a an actual official feasibility study, or you need, you know, you want to do a, um, a business and marketing plan, you can apply for funds to help pay for that up to a maximum of a $75,000 grant. I have to say that in the last 10 years, I've seen a lot less use out of the planning grants. I remember years ago when the real large farms, they would pay for, you know, big feasibility studies. But so um, it's still there, but seems like um, our state is kind of, uh, um, at least for our value added, been seeing a lot of um, smaller type uh, farms that are that are um, bypassing that. So the working capital is the two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar grant, and that is for operational and processing. Um, so anything post harvest, uh, and that would be processing, marketing, advertising, packaging, could be uh, shipping, um, gas funds for getting it to market. I mean all things that that would cost you packaging you know, labels everything um and then again remind you that it is a one-to-one -one match or 50 50 so let's say you were applying for the full two hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant that would mean that your project is a five hundred thousand dollar project overall it might probably be a three-year project so you're making all of those estimates for that. Um, and then your share or your match would be 50,000. And I'll talk a little bit about matching funds um, in the next slides. Okay. Um, I think uh, under matching, um, excuse me, under um, types of projects, I think there was a few examples on the um, previous application, um, but you know we see just such a wide variety in our state, and we are one of the top five states for using value-added um, program. But we see everything from milk to ice cream, um, but it can be used, you know, to market it. You can market it just as local foods. You can market it as a change in state. Um, and there's also, there's all kinds of ways to make this grant work for you. Okay, we'll move to the next slide. Um, applicant types. Um, generally, we see independent producers. Almost 90% of our applications in our state are to independent producers. Um, the other type of applicants could be ag producer groups, farmer and rancher cooperatives. We do see a number of those. We have um, cooperative um, that has applied in Kitsap County before and some other counties too. And then the fourth type would be majority controlled producer-based businesses. Okay, next slide. Um, methods to add value. So you really only need to pick one for your project. Um, and in the application template, which is made available to you, you know, it's a, there's a lot of pages of checking boxes and one of them would be to check which, which one of these uh, methods to add value you're selecting. So I select one, don't select, you know, one out of four. Um, 
But usually what we see is people that are changing the physical state of their product. Um, but we also see a lot of just locally produced, marketed, and distributed. So if you're just marketing your product as local, locally produced and marketed, that means within the state of Washington or um, as far as 400 miles, uh, that can be one of your methods. So we do see that method selected a lot. If you select more than one of these, you have to document and explain each and every one in your application. So that would be one reason to pick the one that resonates or makes the most sense for you. And you'll hear a little bit more from Ryan on um, his projects and what one he used. The third one, enhanced production methods. And that's another one that is used and product segregation. And I think, um, Ryan may mention that, but the first two here are what we usually see. It does mention renewable energy under the, the um, our value added program, um, but it is where you're using your own product, like let's say um, seed oil and you're, you know, for biomass oil. Um, we've done it in the past, but really our REAP program is more the program for that. So that's what I would recommend if you, if you're wondering about that on that slide. Next. Um, I mentioned some eligible, eligible expenses before. Um, this is everything you could think of. Processing, labor. Uh, this could be overhead costs. Um, you could um, extract the utilities that are being paid for this particular project. Um, you can pay for additional ingredients. So let's just say you're making pesto is your value added project, but you're only growing the basil, but you still need whatever other um, items go in there. Garlic, let's say you have to buy garlic. You know, you can pay for that ingredient. And that goes um, for any type of uh, example of a value added um, project, you're, you're, you're only supplying one of the ingredients or more uh, and you can purchase under eligible expense, expenses the others. You can use expenses such as packaging, label, labeling. Um, I mentioned some um, other commodities that you may need to purchase. So let's just use the pesto one. Let's say you didn't grow enough of the pesto. You do have the, excuse me, basil. If you have to supply over 50% of the basil for your product, you may have to purchase additional, um, including that basil. Um, but the over 50% would have to be supplied by you yourself. You can pay for advertising, any kind of marketing and promotion. You can pay for financial and accounting costs attributed to your value added project. Um, uh, web um, updating and development, um, distribution, shipping, delivery. Uh, you know, there's a lot more that could be added to this list, but these are some main examples. Let's go to the next slide. Some ineligible expenses. Um, so right away, and I kind of mentioned this in the beginning, it's, it is not a grant that's used for construction purposes or for adding vehicles or needed equipment. Um, it is not related to production or harvesting um, or pre, you know, your, your growing expenses, any of that. It's not for that or any kind of engineering or, or architecture for, for um, building expenses. Next slide. So you can kind of think of it as far as the working capital expenses that are allowed post harvest. It's all those things that would be, if you think about it, really hard to borrow money on. Where our grant is a, um, you know, provides assistance um, to the ag producer doing a value added product, where, you know, it's a little harder to come up with those funds um, from a lender, whereas the construction and um, equipment and those kind of things might be hard also, but those are security-based things that lenders are out there um, providing. Okay. Um, under value-added working 
capital project. This is an example of Moon Valley Organics. It's located up in Whatcom County. I think it was a few, maybe a few years ago, and they've been successful. Um, so they they were able to complete their project utilizing a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant, and then they matched at two hundred and fifty thousand. So they used um, their grant as an independent producer. Um, they used their funds for packaging and marketing a current project that, or excuse me, a current product that they were already producing. Their personal care products um, with ingredients that they harvest. And in this case, they were able to create 10 jobs. So there are some things we do want to see in a, in a value-added um, producer grant. And one of them is that you do plan to increase your revenue, your customers, and um, hopefully save or create jobs. So that's why that was mentioned here. Let's move on. Another example I think this is in Eastern Washington, but here they were able to utilize $217,000 grant under working capital, another independent producer, and they used it for packaging, marketing, and processing costs. And they've turned their um, wheat that they grow into flour. And that's right, it's in Walla Walla County. So that was a successful grant also. Next. Um, a few things, um, because I was keeping it kind of short, and I really do welcome anyone who wants to give me a phone call or an email to talk a little bit more, because there, this is admittedly a complicated and in-depth application, so I don't want to hide that fact, but what I like to do is show you what the application template looks like together um, and talk about the different um, details of applying um, and what type of application you're looking for. For um, simplified application, you know, honestly, it's not that much simpler, except the only thing, it would not require a feasibility study being done by a third party. And those are grants that would be under 50,000. So we see quite a lot of 49,900 taller um, simplified applications so that they can, um, move on with their value added product without doing a third party feasibility study. Um, if you are going for a grant that's over that, um, you um, will be looking at providing feasibility study and business planning. And so those are the kind of things that if you have something in mind, we can kind of go through on a case by case to see what fits, fits for you. And, and again, I welcome you to contact me at any time. And thank you. Okay, um, I think uh, we've got a couple questions in the Q and A, and I know we had talked about maybe leaving those to the end, but I'm wondering if if a couple of these can be uh, quick answers. Um, so we've got a question about if can matching funds come from other grants, or does it have to be cash? Good question. So that I, I did not have in my slides um, for time permitting. So the 50% of the grant, so let's say you're putting together the largest project and you need 250,000 match. Some of that can be cash or loan. Some of it can be the value of your own commodity. Some of it can be your own in-kind labor that you're applying that value of your in-kind labor to that project, um, those would be, or in some could be, in some cases, third party um, donation to, to the project also. So there's um, quite a number of ways to include um, the matching funds. In scoring, I think you get a little bit extra for providing some cash to that um, matching fund requirement. Does that answer that? I think so. We'll, we'll hear if, uh, <laughs> if they have follow-up. Um, and then one more question. Uh, 
Can you explain more about how marketing our business as quote local counts as value added? For example, our farm grows produce that we advertise as locally grown, but we don't make value added products with our produce. Can we apply for the VAPG grant? Yes, so it's actually used a lot. Um, if you if you're growing, I'm assuming multiple vegetable items, let's say, or, or or maybe even meat and vegetables, whatever. But if you're going to market your products as locally produced, which you are, um, that is one of the the acceptable um, methods of adding value because it is proven, and you will show that in your application, documenting that people are paying more at the grocery store or more at the market for locally produced food. Um, and so that is just one of the, the methods that can be used and it's used a lot in our state. And it's uh, not to be confused with organic, but sometimes they go hand in hand too. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Great. Um, and one last one, uh, can matching funds be labor done by the business owner or owners if it is through guaranteed payments instead of payroll? Uh, I'm not sure what guaranteed payments mean. Um, jo Joanne, I believe, um, if you if you want to unmute or um, type in uh, further clarification and then um, we can come back and maybe answer that. Um, um, yeah, I can just chime in here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Great. Um, guaranteed payments, it's, or it's just, if you're an S corp, you can pay yourself via payroll. So I would have a payroll stub to, to submit to the grant for that payment or for that, um, reimbursement. Um, whereas guaranteed payments are just like a different way of paying yourself as a business owner. If you're not, if you're not an S corp, basically, I don't Maybe that's two in the weeds for right now. <laughs> well, I just want to say that I just have never heard of that. So in the in-kind matching, um, you're only allowed to cover 25% of the total project with your own in-kind labor, but you can't pay yourself. So it has to be, so I, I might be getting mixed up, but you can't pay yourself with grant funds. You're applying what the value of your labor is to that um, part of the matching funds. So I, I don't know if that okay. helps clarify. But if we talk further, we can get into it further, but- um, Okay, great, thank you so much. Yeah, but you can't pay yourself with grant. Got it, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Carlotta. And we'll go ahead and pass it over to Ryan. Hi, so I'm Ryan McCarthy with NODC. Ryan, you're muted. Thanks, sorry about that. That was my big fear going into this that I was gonna do that. So I'm uh, Ryan with NODC, and I'm gonna start with some tips and examples from my experience with these programs related to applying for and implementing these grants as part of your business's growth strategy. Starting with a few general tips, as Elise mentioned earlier, starting early is critical especially with the federal grants, you have the requirements like the SAM and DUNS registrations to make sure that you have everything on time. You also have those letters of support and letters of commitment. And uh, those are things that you don't want to leave for the last minute. They're going to take time to get back from the people that you ask to write them. Um, I think that at least I mentioned, I would, I would elaborate a little bit on the difference between letters of support and letters of commitment. In short, your letters of support, I learned from my first to my second grant application, your letters of support are people saying how they're going to support your project, more or less like a letter of good standing type thing um, in the community, where your letters of commitment are going to be actual letters from buyers and producers, uh, or excuse me, buyers of your product, potential customers and market channels that are going to say like maybe the amount of product that they'll specifically not necessarily commit in a purchase order, but more or less what they expect they would they would expect to purchase from your um, resulting project or product from your project. Uh, next, thoroughly researching funding opportunities and tailoring your your proposal to the grantor's priorities. I merged those two points together to share just a personal example. 
Um, I first met Carlotta at an in-person workshop like this, but I think it was like a three or four hour version. And I went to that workshop with a project in mind of what I wanted to do. And I found that the funding didn't cover the equipment that I was going to need. So I left discouraged. Um, after the workshop, I found the REAP grant more approachable. So I went that direction first. And I'll be sharing more on all these projects later. But the following year, I attended the same workshop again with creativity and flexibility in mind. And I was able to create a project that fit the funding priorities. Looking back, I wish I would have applied the first year, but the lesson was valuable in the long run because it helped me craft a number of other applications for grant opportunities, applying that same approach of looking for ways to tailor the project based on the funding priorities. Um, of my two funded value-added producer grant projects, both started by storyboarding ideas on a whiteboard, crafting a rough draft of what a budget might look like, and then that turned into a full draft of a project budget, project narrative, a business plan, and eventually a full application. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the projects in detail in some later slides, but one was a locally produced marketing campaign, and the other was a product segregation grant to add higher value to the agricultural commodity. So next, you want a compelling narrative to demonstrate the impact of your project. The narrative explains your project, and you'll need a business plan. I tailored both of my grant business plans to the project so it would read as a project-specific business plan and somewhat of an internal feasibility study to show the financial benefits of the project. With my second, the segregation one, I actually was required to have a, a feasibility study done for the project. And then finally, staying organized. The application itself can be intimidating, but it's a template that guides you through the process. And while it's not a point on the slideshow scoring yourself, the grant gives a clear description of what's required in each field. And so it gives you a, a point range so you can actually figure out approximately what your expected score might be. Next slide. Thanks. So how to use grants. Uh, grants became an important part of my strategy for growing my business. Agricultural businesses are different from one another in terms of size, scale, and commodity produced. But grant funding can be a great supplemental source of funds to accomplish specific planning or business growth tasks or to launch a new product line. In my case, the fund served as the springboard to expand our marketing reach and hire the additional staff to enter new markets. And in the example of that second uh, segregation value added producer grant project, it helped transform our product to a higher value niche product to further distinguish ourselves in the marketplace and reduce competition when we converted to selling a 100% A2 beta casein product line. Finding opportunities that fit your needs. That could be something like expanding into a new product line, turning berries into jam, or it could be something simpler um, like that locally produced option where you're marketing under an existing attribute, locally produced or maybe organic, certified salmon safe, certified humane. Um, I added to the, to the slide here, less can be more because keeping a project narrow and focused helps open doors for similar but different projects in the future, where if your project is too broad or too broad of a description or you try and meet all those different criteria, like Carlotta mentioned, you can apply under multiple, but then it might be harder in the future to differentiate a new project and, and explain how it's not a repeat of one that you've already done because you can only be funded one time for each project. So I have a few examples. As I mentioned, I was uh, fortunate to be awarded a REAP grant on a solar project and two value-added producer grants. One was for locally produced and marketed distributed, and then the other was project product segregation. So if we go to the next slide, I'll start with my 2015 REAP grant. The data on these slides is obsolete, but I included it all to show an example of how planning, budgeting, and impact analysis of a project can play out. And this was for a 72 panel solar project that you see in the picture. Next. This was about an $80,000 project with a 25% cost share at the time. Like Carlotta just mentioned, now it's 50% cost share. Uh, this pr produces about 24,000 kilo 24, kilowatt hours of electricity each year, which is enough energy to power two and a half average American homes. Uh, there were different funding cycles at that time for projects above and below the $80,000 mark. And had this project not been funded, the plan was to increase it by a couple of solar panels. So it would be over $80,000 and apply in the next funding cycle. Uh, next slide. So these incentives have all changed. 
but these are the incentives that were applied to calculate the payback of the grant project, which included the value of the energy produced, production incentives, federal tax incentives, and the 75% Washington state sales tax exemption that was in place at the time. Uh, next. And here's just more of the detail that I had had at the time that just showed um, the depreciation that I calculated based on the, the corporate tax structure that was in place at the time. And again, all of that's changed. So we can go to the next slide. And here's the final projected payback. The system paid for itself fully in five years. My actual results varied by a couple months from the original projection because one of the, the incentive programs was oversold and prorated. But I included this to show the importance of thorough planning and developing a project. And next slide. This was for my 2016 value added producer grant market expansion project. This was a $250,000 cost share on a $500,000 project. Uh, this included, a, or I included a couple pictures on this slide of some of the marketing materials that were paid for the, by the grant, like the photography, the vinyl wraps, videography, the website redesign, hiring additional staff to do in-store promotions and events and packaging and materials. Uh, delivery wages, kind of all the all the costs associated with taking that value added commodity of just milk in the bulk tank, all the way to the retail and consumer. Uh, one of the biggest lessons learned from doing some of the marketing and outreach was that we had to expand pretty quickly with this project, and the grant funds were a big help in pushing through the costs associated with our growth. Uh, next slide. This is a slide that shows one of the budget task components from the application so that you can see how the spending is projected and tracked in these grant projects. This particular grant had four different tasks, and this was task two. It says uh, cooperative retail promotions was the title of this task. And this was the smallest and simplest of the tasks, just so that I didn't confuse it with too much. You can see there was a question earlier about uh, cash match and, and then the in-kind contribution in this case could be, I believe, uh, the owner's owner's time committed to that project. Uh, the personnel column in this one is for the wages for a product representative that was doing retail and promotion events, like product samplings. And then the supplies column was for the cost associated with the materials to create the display booth to give out those samples. And this shows how the funds are broken down by grant funds versus what I paid that the grant calls cash matching funds. So next slide. In 2020, this was the other value added producer grant, which was a product segregation grant. The segregation project simplified could be something like producing potatoes and selling them all for the same price. But if you were to separate the red potatoes, if they were worth more to get a higher price point, then doing that segregation of those products would be an example of, of product segregation. My original plan was to separate milk from the cows that produced only A2 beta casein proteins, which ended up being complicated for us. And due to market demand, or thankfully with market demand, we were able to go with a 100% A2 product line and carry out the grant. These funds helped refresh our branding, brand identity, increased our price point and margins and made us more competitive in the marketplace. The expenses covered on this grant were similar to the first project. It covered 50% of the marketing, processing, packaging costs, and delivery and distribution expenses for the project. Next slide. And finally, the reflective considerations. These are some of the considerations and insights I learned from my experience with the grant pro programs. Keeping good records is critical, not just in the grant writing process, but also staying on top of your reporting requirements. If your project covers everything you do that's related to value added, that'll be easier for tracking, where otherwise you'll have to track expenses separately or prorate costs associated with the project, which ties into, and I don't have the date offhand, but we have that class coming up on, on um, accounting systems, and that's really helpful to have a good accounting system in place to be able to show your, your projected budgets, to look at, at your past data for your business to analyze what you could realistically spend and what kind of growth you could realistically project when you do your business plan, as well as for your reporting in the future. And then asking for help and feedback. There's a lot of help available locally, as well as Carlotta and the team at the USDA office. Like Carlotta mentioned, we're in the top, top couple, um, Washington State's consistently in the top two or three states for the number of these grants 
funded and funds awarded nationally. And in the example of my value added producer grant, I also found prior recipients are more than more than helpful uh, when it comes to talking about their grant projects or ex exchanging ideas. Um, I actually went to a farm in a snowstorm in I think 2015 or 2016 uh, when I was writing that application for the, the first project. And they didn't know how to, how to scan and fax, but they said I could come up there and sit at their kitchen table. So I sat for about eight hours one day and went through their grant, talked ideas, and, and just took a whole bunch of notes to go back and develop the, the project that I ended up ended up uh, applying for. And then these last two things go together, documenting the successes and failures and exercising perseverance in refining grant writing skills. This is an area I improved a lot from my first to my second application, especially for the value added producer grant. I asked for my score on the first application so I could study how to improve. And even though I was funded, I learned from some of the mistakes that I made on how I could score better because I didn't fully understand the scoring criteria. I also found the components of the grants build on each other and become a great resource to use in the future applications. So I highly recommend organizing and archiving your grant writing documents and narratives from all your projects. And the last thing I'll add is the USDA grants seem daunting at first, but the application serves as a template in just about every grant. And they really set everyone up for success, creating a level playing field. It just takes some time and perseverance. And if anyone has any questions either here today or wants to follow up with questions, looking for a place to start, um, Elise and I are here with NODC and are excited to learn about projects and see how we can help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ryan, great job. Um, and we will uh, go ahead and open it uh, to Q&A now. Um, hopefully you all are feeling uh, inspired to take on some projects uh, and know that there's help out there. If you are feeling a little uh, intimidated, we're all here to to help you succeed. Um, so right now I'm only seeing one question in the chat um, or in the Q&A and it's saying, are these resources only for food producers? I'm a flower farmer. So um, Carlotta, maybe uh, for like value added and whatnot, um, have you seen uh, any examples of flower farmers or anything like that? Uh, yes, for flowers though, they um, it can't simply be just cut flowers and sold as a cut flower bouquet. It would have to be, um, um, it's hard to make work, put it that way. Um, so it would have to be made into, it would have to be a change in physical state because it can't qualify under locally because that's for food only. So um, so if it's just cut flowers into bouquets, that does not work. I think in some cases it could work if it was like um, it changed it into a dried flower type of a um, type of a artistic thing, you know what I mean? Um, but you can't use the locally grown food. So that was a little trickier. Good question. Yeah, great. And that will go ahead and follow up. Like, regardless, in terms of resource support, and you know, like Ryan said, we're here and happy to hear um, about your ideas and what's happening with your business. So, in terms of resource um, support, uh, we like if that is your business, you grow flowers. Like, we're here to support that, um, and we can also help find other opportunities out there that might uh, might align with whatever it is you're doing. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're here to help if you're growing flowers too. Um, any other questions? I will go ahead and ask, uh, oh, wait. Okay, so I own, I co-own a business growing and selling vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. Could we apply for VAPG grant? Could you repeat that real quick? So I co-own a business growing and selling vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. So could we apply for a VAPG grant? So if they're a seed producer. Yes, seed production can qualify. Okay, great. Um, I'll go ahead and ask a question, Ryan, to put you on the spot a little bit. Not really, hopefully. Um, but I know that you have, uh, in, in all your experience, you have... Uh, used other like outside resources. So you mentioned having like a good accounting system or budget, like 
in your process, like, is that something you all had in house? Um, did you outsource, you know, any grant writing, grant editing, any of that for these? And um, with that in mind, would you go back and and pay for those services again? Um, and did you find that helpful? Those are all great questions. Um, I did with my first grant, or sorry, going back to the financial piece, we already had QuickBooks for the accounting system, which helped track everything to be able to monitor the, the projects themselves. For the second, or sorry, first grant, I did pay a grant writing firm um, about $3,000. It was a 20 hour, 115 hour at the time. That was 2016 pricing um, to do a review of my grant and give me a few pointers and changes. For my next grant, I actually did that part myself um, or just skipped that part. I think it was helpful in the first one as a confidence booster. And I didn't at the time know of any other resources to review it all for me. And I had a fear I was going to miss one of the deadlines. In fact, that was one of the lessons learned from the farmer that I mentioned in the snowstorm. They were able to share the insight that they missed a minor detail on their first application where I think it was a financial form for the matching funds was more than 30 days old as of the date of the application. And I think that was a, at the time a disqualifying factor for them. So for fear of, of some sort of mistake like that, I think Carlotta can probably chime in if this is still correct. I think if you have more than a 10% misallocation of pledged funds for an ineligible activity, that can be another disqualifier. That's but correct. I, I wouldn't do those personally. I wouldn't spend the money again on those because the, the application really does lend itself to being user-friendly at the producer level. So it definitely can be done um, yourself. Um, and Carlotta, I'll go ahead and ask um, uh, on the other side of things, have you, what have you seen people particularly run into in terms of, uh, do they run up against issues with timelines and fulfilling, you know, deliverables in, in the timelines of the project that they've outlined? And um, if you've seen, is that, does that tend to happen more in like the longer, like you said, like a three-year project or something like that, or um, kind of any, any issues you see arising that people can um, take note of? Um, well, back to just doing the application. So we don't have that much time left for this um, uh, year's application deadline. Um, the sooner you can work on it, the sooner you can actually submit it to me or, or somebody else on my team to review it. We're supposed to have a month, but usually we'll still be reviewing it two weeks to a week before the deadline because there could be something that a person misses. Um, they think they have the whole thing together or um, so it's really important. We can give it a once over. We don't want to be in the position to guarantee you that, uh, you know, you've included every single thing, but we can definitely read through it and and catch some things or suggest additions to it. Um, and, so, you know, what I have seen is people missing the point that in the, in the template is there's an area for it, but you do have to point out how many customers you do plan to increase and your revenue increase and um, jobs and things like that. So sometimes people just sort of, you know, miss it. It's a big application template. Mm -hmm. So I do suggest that as far as people making it through their whole project, whether it's a, a smaller one of a year or two or, or a full, you know, the, the largest at three years, um, most of our um, projects, I think, make it through. There's a, a smaller percentage of people that, you know, um, either things occur, you know, in their personal lives or their financial things where they can't finish. Um, usually we're able to give a lot of support through the rough time at the beginning. So for like reporting and, um, you know, really tracking all those expenses, that can be really kind of stressful and a little difficult because we want our reporting the way we want it on our forms and, and such as that. But we are really good on our end at helping you through, especially the first couple of them and the reimbursement process. It can be frustrating. So on our end, we try really hard to try to help you get the numbers in the right place and that kind of thing. So um, typically we are seeing our projects finishing out on time and where they've used all the funds. Sometimes they haven't used all the funds 
for whatever reason. But um, we, again, we try really hard to keep all those things in in order. Yeah, and I think that's really valuable. And I want to highlight that for anyone who's joining us today is that that service that um, you know you're able to submit before the actual deadline to have some you know eyes on it and and talk to you about points that maybe need to be strengthened or whatnot. Like that is not something that all grants do by any means. Um, a lot of times you just send them into the void and hope for the best. So the fact that uh, Carlotta and her colleagues um, are there to provide that, that's that's really huge and definitely um, another reason to start early and, and be involved with the people on the other end because that's a rare and super valuable service. So, um, and I think Kelly mentioned in the chat that if you want to come off mute and ask a question, um, you're more than welcome to do that. So we'll be quiet for a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, we will be sending out um, after this. So people that weren't able to join, we it was recorded. So uh, we will be posting that, uh, WSU will be posting that to their online learning resource library. Um, and we will also be emailing people with um, all relevant information, all the resources uh, mentioned here today in the presentation, um, our contact information. Um, and yeah, oh, Kelly is prompting. So do be sure to take a few minutes and fill out the um, webinar evaluation that's super important for all of us and uh, to, for for future educational opportunities like the um, the data that is provided in that is is really impactful and also in terms of as, as I mentioned this is a result of a USDA grant and so um, in terms of our reporting purposes it's it's super helpful for us to um, to talk about the impact and uh, the numbers and so um, oh someone does have another question uh, for you Carlotta um, do you also manage the SARE grant? I think that's. Um, yeah. I answered it in there, but uh, okay. it's not a real development grant. Okay. I've that heard is... of it, but it's not a real development grant. So. Yeah, so. and I mentioned that, I'll be sending that out. I mentioned it in one of the earlier slides. It's Western, I can't remember the, the entity off the top of my head, but um, I will uh, include that link as well, so. Elise. Is it okay if I highlight some of the upcoming trainings just to remind folks? Absolutely, um, please. Okay, I'd love to share my screen. Yep. So as we mentioned a number of times today, we have additional trainings that are coming up. Uh, one is happening this week and it's responding to microaggressions. It's in person Thursday, February 8th in the afternoon, evening time. And this is really great for folks who work at, work at farmer's markets and just interact with individuals and identifying what microaggressions look like and how you can respond. Um, and then the, the next training series we have in person will be bookkeeping, sales and reporting. After that is tax season. And then we have two marketing uh, workshops and events all about branding, marketing, accessing new market channels, exploring new ways of expanding your business. So um, you will receive a follow-up email with lots of information, including the registration to the rest of these classes. So I just wanted to plug that. Back to you, Elise. Okay, great. I think um, unless, you know, we, we gave it an hour and a half in case there were lots of questions, um, but we know you all are very busy people. So we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here. Hopefully uh, you got some new information and are aware of some of the supports out there uh, to help you. And um, we really do hope to hear from you if we can be of any help. So please do reach out um, and thank you. And uh Take care of yourselves out there. Stay warm and uh, hopefully spring will be here soon. Thank you. Thank you.